Hello everyone, welcome to Hot Seat. I'm Omid Moradas from Iran. And once again, I'm so grateful and happy to be your host from this platform. Today, uh, we're gonna have a different aspect in infant dentistry to cover. Uh, over the past sessions, we had uh, speakers talking about soft tissue grafting, talking about hard tissue grafting, about growth factors, about complications in aesthetic zone. And now we reach the point to talk about prostodontic approach in infant dentistry and what are the important factors that we need to consider because one of the main things that we should take into consideration is the prosthetic part because infant dentistry, at the end of the day, the patient, what patient is seeing and want is the final outcome, which is in the hand of the prosthodontist or the dentist that doing the prosto work. So today, I have a very dear friend from United States, Safa Tahmosevi is here with us. Hey, Safa. Welcome to Hot Hey, Amijan. How are you? Welcome to Hot Thank you. Good so happy to, to have you. you. Thank you for accepting this invitation. Today, Safa is going to talk about implant abutment material selection for predictable and long-term stability of the outcome, which we believe is one of the most important aspects in prosthodontics. So as a tradition, I will have Safa's CV for all of you, and then we go to the presentation. It will be interactive. We have so many questions between the presentation. So I'm pretty sure you will all enjoy this webinar. Uh, Dr. Safa Thomas have received a Bachelor of Science in Biology degree from St. John's University at Queens, New York in 2005. He his Doctor of Dental Surgery degree from the State University of New York at Buffalo School of Dental Medicine in 2009. And after finishing his general practice residency fellowship at the Montefiore Medical Center in Bronx, New York in 2010, he went on the complete, to complete his advanced education program, Master of Science in Prosthodontics at the West Virginia University School of Dentistry in 2013. And then he joined the same, same day dental implant Brandenburg Osteointegration Center in Dubai as a clinical director specializing in full mouse implant rehabilitation and smile reconstruction. He has been lecturing on full mouse implant rehabilitation protocols nationally and internationally at major conferences around the world. And in 2019, he moved back to the United States to join the Metro Charlotte Pure Choice Dental Implant Center as a key member of the team specializing in immediate loading protocols and full mouse implant rehabilitation. Safa, we are so happy to have you with us and ready for your presentation. Thank you for having us, Omid. Um, it's a pleasure to be invited on this uh, platform. Um, and uh, thank you for doing this. I know this takes a lot of work. Uh, so thank you for organizing this uh, during these difficult times uh, where people are stranded at home. And so I appreciate you doing this because you're giving some people uh, food for thought uh, and you're encouraging people to ask questions and you, you're uh, encouraging people to educate themselves. So thank you for doing this. I appreciate it. So um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here and uh, dive into it right away. Just uh, check on your side, just kind of let me know if everything is looking okay so we can proceed. Looks pretty good. Okay. So like Omid, uh, you mentioned earlier, thank you for that kind introduction. Um, and like I said, uh, like you said yourself, uh, implant abutment material selection is, is something that I think is, is a good topic to talk about because, you know, we do such incredible work um, as you and some of your speakers have shown over the past few days, doing some really wonderful soft tissue and bone uh, heart tissue augmentations, some really wonderful uh, surgical techniques. And uh, we can really uh, do some really beautiful work today that we couldn't do 30, 40 years ago. Um, however, like you mentioned yourself, um, if prosthetically we do not finish the job correctly, 
uh, almost everything that we have done and worked hard for can really go to waste. And really the person that uh, sort of um, uh, sees uh, the biggest dis disadvantage of having bad prosthetic work done on dental implants is the patient. And so uh, I thought that in order to s stop some of that from happening, uh, since I've been doing this for the past 10 years, I thought to myself uh, to put a lecture together uh, to sort of um, summarize some of the criteria that are very important for implant bobbin selection. Um, nowhere throughout this lecture are you gonna see me telling uh, people what to do and what's better than the other, but you will see me uh, sort of uh, uh, making an attempt in trying to shine light on some of the principles that are very important for uh, choosing the right implant above it. Um, as you can know, after you uh, finish your surgery, you wait for months for osteointegration or whether it's immediate loading. When you're trying to send that uh, prosthesis or that, you know, that, that uh, impression off to the lab, you're faced with uh, lab prescriptions that uh, look like uh, with 100 different types of um, uh, sort of selections on them. And, and so sometimes I find Dennis being confused as to what's the right implant above them, uh, material to choose. So I thought in this lecture, I will sort of summarize some of the most important criteria, not, not implant companies, not specific components, but just the criteria, the generalized um, uh, prescriptions that are needed into uh, ordering a successful uh, implant above prosthesis uh, that will give us a long time stable um, peri implant soft tissue stability. So let's dive into it. Um, I love this slide. Uh, this was given to me by Dr. Andrew Aikman. Uh, these implants were placed by Dr. Costa Nicolopoulos, which you know very well, uh, about 24 years ago. And, uh, and the bone level and the soft tissue stability around these implants uh, is a testament of how important it is to respect some of these criteria. Um, I'm not asking anyone to pay attention to whether they're splinted or not. That was, uh, this is an immediate load case that was done too long ago. Uh, splinting is a, is a different topic that we're not going to get into, but I just want you, want people to pay attention to the bone levels after 24 years of service. I would call that success, right? So, you know, we do a lot of implant dentistry. We, we restore, we're happy after one year or six months, we take our x-rays and we're like, oh, look at this. But what, how are these processes in these bone levels look in 24 years, right? This was, this case right here, these x-rays is, is what drives me uh, into doing what I do because I would love my patients uh, to be able to have such bone levels in the future. So, you know, this is a perfect testament of that. Uh, this is a patient that walked into my clinic uh, not too long ago, and he says to me, he says, Doc, you know, uh, you know, I did an upper arch on him and up an all on four, and he says, Doc, I have this lower implant on my lower right side, and it's been uh, sort of disconnected and loosened about 30 times. Every time I go to the dentist, they, they tighten them up for me, and then... Um, can you just kind of take a look? And so I, you know, I unscrew because it was a screw tip illustration. I unscrew it, and you can just see it uh, on the image on the right. Look at that plaque biofilm accumulation. Look at that connection. It's not pristine. You can see burn markings on there. You can see uh, laboratory degradation. You can see um, uh, that that connection is no longer the pristine connection that was intended to be coming out of the manufacturer. So, so there, there is some disconnect there. Um, we are not really looking at the connection. So I thought uh, we should be talking about these uh, a little bit. So I try to categorize uh, this peri-implant prosthetic stability into four different, connect, uh, four different criteria. Uh, uh, screw retention, emergence profile, having a perfect fit, and the soft tissue biocompatibility. Um, you and I gave a lecture in Tehran uh, not too long ago at the third uh, uh, Implant Complication Symposium and uh, you know you gave a lecture right after I did about similar topics and it was very encouraging to see you cover the same sort of materials uh, and so that means that you and I are on the same page so at any point please jump in and, and give some, uh, some of your thoughts because I think you and I agree on these topics uh, very closely. So uh, I'm going to try to cover all of these four uh, without going into details, uh, just kind of giving a generic, generic idea of 
you know, how we should be respecting these principles. So let's start with screw retention. Um, you know, this topic of screw retention uh, versus cement retention is a very old topic. Uh, there has been an endless amount of studies and, and systematic reviews and meta analyses done on, on the comparison of screw retention versus cement retention. But I thought I would give a different perspective on that. I'm not really going to dive into literature so much, but I'm just kind of kind of uh, give clinical tips into why one is better than the other. But at no point am I going to say that um, you, you, we should be very radical in our decision making. I'm not saying that you must do screw retention uh, and cement retention is not right. That is not correct. Cement retention uh, is, is a very viable treatment. Uh, sometimes it is absolutely needed, and I do like cement retention, retention, but it does require meticulous technique, which we're going to dive into a little bit. I just find screw retention to be not only clinically more beneficial, I also think that uh, financially, uh, screw retention uh, is, is a better option for the doctor. So we've all seen these images before. Um, you know, uh, peri-implant cementitis is something that uh, you yourself as a periodontist have probably dealt with uh, more than one occasion. Um, you know, Wilson 2009 said that 80% of peri-implantitis is secondary to subgingival uh, cement accumulation. And, and uh, with Juani and uh, uh, um, Thomas Lincovicius and many other people have talked about cement uh, accumulation into the sulcus. And, and uh, it is sometimes very sad and discouraging to see that because the implant placements are some, sometimes so beautiful, but a little bit of cement can really take things downhill. And the x-ray you see on the top right hill, uh, top uh, bottom right was given to me by Stephen Chu, uh, done by uh, Dennis Tarna, one of the uh, most uh, uh, famous periodontists in the world. So even, even people at that level can make mistakes. Uh, so at no time should we uh, be arrogant in our decision-making saying, no, no, it doesn't happen to me. I think cement happens to everyone. It has happened to me, it has happened to many, many other people. So we have to be very careful of that. The other problem with cement retention uh, is also the incomplete seating. Sometimes people uh, use cement that's set before the crown is seated fully. So you get incomplete seating. But you don't see that. Uh, you have a little bit of a um, um, sort of a increased occlusal adjustment that is needed. And so you're sitting in there and you're grinding the whole beautiful occlusal anatomy away. And the problem was that it was incomplete seating. And it's sort of a re irreversible situation at that point, not only for you, but for the patient, you can't start over. So you just kind of leave it. And that gap accumulates bacteria and biofilm. And over time, it creates some other problems. Many people have talked about this topic. Thomas Lincovicius showed that uh, subgingival margins uh, lead to increased uh, cement being accumulated into the sulcus. And also he did one very beautiful study where they made otherwise screw retained, screw retained uh, prostheses or crowns and they made them cement retained, but then they had access to the screw access hole. They cemented them and once they removed them, almost all of them had cement uh, uh, accumulated into the sulcus. So that kind of showed that even though you may think that you may be able to control the cement a little bit, cement still gets in there. It's hydraulic pressure, it oozes out, it gets into the sulcus. Um, and sometimes it causes a lot of damage. Not to mention uh, that some people say, well, you know, if you clean it correctly and you scale it and you get in underneath there. Well, most of us know, especially as Periodontists, you guys know that you're not supposed to be scaling your implants so much. This is a study done by Don John Agar in 1997, showing, showing uh, whether you use plastic scalers or you use gold scalers, no matter what you do, you can take a, a pristine uh, polished abutment and you can uh, scratch it heavily and that could really lead, lead into some biofilm accumulation. Not, uh, also, let's talk about retrievability. I mean, you can make a cement retained restoration on here, and then after four or five years of function, patients get older or a little bit of recession may occur, and now you have that margin showing, which can be even more catastrophic if you're dealing with the titanium about it. If this was a cement retained restoration, you will just remove it, you will send it back to the lab, and you would add porcelain and you would fix it. Like in this case, for example, if it happens, since this is a screw retained, you remove it and you, and you apply it back on. But if it's a cement retained restoration, almost everybody has had this conversation with patients where the patient walks in, the crown is loose, 
And then you have to have a conversation with the patient. Hey, listen, I'm going to go and start looking for the screw access hole, but I made down. That's a very difficult discussion to have with the patient because now the patient says, well, I have to pay for another crown. And so, but if it was a screw retained restoration, it would be so simple. You just unscrew it, uh, find out why this screw loosening happened. Maybe the preload was not enough. Uh, maybe there was, uh, in, in maybe the inner proximal contacts were too heavy. So these are things that we can do and, and um, uh, some, uh, you know, retrievability becomes very important. This is something that we cannot really do with cement retained restorations. So another, uh, the reason why I think screw tent restorations uh, are very important is because of the uh, prosthetic space. So uh, most of us know that for cement retained restorations, we need um, anything um, between uh, maybe uh, uh, nine to 10 or more millimeters of inner closure space. But with screw retention, sometimes there are a couple studies that show that all you need is roughly anything between 6.5 to 6.96 millimeters of intercooler space. And we have had many situations where we've had limited amount of intercooler space. So by having a screw tank prosthesis, uh, we can really uh, uh, do the patients a service um, and not have to get into space problems. So since we have seen all of these clinical tips into why screw retention is better than cement retained restorations, I always ask myself, then why are people doing cement retained restorations? I couldn't really understand it for, very, for a very long time in the beginning of my, probably because of the anatomical constraints. For example, let's look at this CT scan cross-section, right? Um, most implant surgeons, especially people that are into immediate placement, immediate loading, know that you must always fish for the most amount of bone to get your primary stability. That's the first thing that a surgeon looks at. How much bone do we have? How can I get my primary stability? Where can I get my fixation uh, of my fixture? And so in this x-ray, if you look, uh, most of that bone is on the lingual, it's on the palatal side. And that is really the area that you want to be able to drill into and anchor your, your fixture. By doing that, you are sort of uh, fixating yourself for a cement retained restoration. You have really no choice because the way you have placed this fixture right now doesn't really give you the ability to make a screw retained restoration. So what we do is we make angulated abutments. You make an angulated abutment and you fix the screw access hole and you make the screw access hole come out of the central fossa. So sometimes some people, uh, they try to to bite, let me, let me try to uh, still get screw retention and uh, place the implant. And this is what happens right here. And uh, this surgeon right here placed the implant for a screw retained restoration without paying a lot of attention to uh, the anatomical constraints and the bone topography. So it is screw retained, but then now we have a perforation or maybe a dehiscence problem. Sometimes we get away with it. There is so much bone out, out there that we do get away with it. So it's not uh, often a problem here. Uh, but sometimes we do. Um, let me refer you to this study done by Joe Kahn a few years back, back in 2011, where they looked at the CT scan of various um, uh, cross sections of uh, uh, teeth in the anterior maxilla. And almost uh, every uh, one of them had a different topography. So 81% of the situation uh, is in class one, and then uh, class four is the most after class one, followed by class two and class three. So just to kind of simplify it, this is how it looks like. So 81% of the situations looks like in the first image, and 11% of the situation look like in the last image, and you can kind of see the difference. Each one of these is going to require a different type of implant placement. That's why when you see people talk about socket shields and that kind of stuff, it always occurs to me, what kind of a topography are we talking about? For example, applying socket shields to a class four would be very challenging. So it, it kind of depends uh, on the topography as well. So implant placement with the end in mind is the way to go. To take the anatomy into consideration is the way to go. And you know, to achieve school retention is not always possible. 
for example, you know, we can place an implant in this fashion. Some people place the implant in the palatal plate and they try to engage it to get screw tension, but then you have this huge buccal cantilever. For, for, for class twos, you may be able to get away with placing the implant this way for screw tension, but then our primary stability may be questionable because you don't have so much wall to implant contact. Class three, same situation. And class four, you have no choice but to do a cement retained restoration because there's really no way to move that implant because the bony housing is very limited. So going back to the situation, uh, you know, you probably know this about me uh, in that uh, I use a different type of fixtures. These are angulated fixtures. They're called the coaxis fixtures. And I'm not saying that they are the only fixtures that you should be using. Obviously, there is place for straight implants and angled implants uh, everywhere in the mouth. But I have found these fixtures to be very beneficial because not only it allows me to achieve primary stability, it also allows me to have screw retention. So let's look at this previous scenario that we looked at. If we want to have screw retention in this prosthesis and we want the screw access hole to come out of the central fossa and right in the middle of the crown, and we still want to engage that bone palatal to the, to the attraction socket, if we place an angled fixture where the apex of the implant is engaging that palatal bone, however, the screw access channel is 12 degrees angulated towards the palatal, not only are we going to be able to achieve very high primary stability, we can also achieve uh, screw retention 99.999% uh, of the time. And so when we look at the Jokan uh, classification again, I find this fixture to be able to give us screw retention almost every time. Um, and we go through different protocols. There's a couple of surgical protocols that you have to apply to these fixtures. But as you can see in these images, that you could actually place a screw retention uh, a fixture in almost each one of these classifications. And if you look at class four frigs, for instance, you can use a 24 degree uh, fixture implant and, and achieve screw retention. Uh, almost all the time. Having said that, I'm not beating on uh, cement retained restorations. I think cement retained restorations are very necessary. This is a case that I did so, so long ago, but they do require some meticulous uh, techniques. So let's talk about that a little bit. This is an, a, a lateral that had some internal and external resorption and need to be extracted. So we did two laterals here with precise margin placement, uh, zirconia buckets, very beautifully done. You can see the abutments having the right profile. Finish line placement is in the right place. After the surgery, uh, uh, the surgery was done. Uh, uh, grafting was done. And these are the final prosthesis. And you can see the soft tissue uh, uh, stability. You can see the papilla position. Everything looks fantastic. And this is a seven year follow up. Uh, of this case with great bone levels uh, and fantastic margin placement, no cement, retain, no cement retention into the sulcus, and they do work well. But as you can see, fabrication of these abutments can be very difficult. We need to work with technicians who understand these concepts. We need to work with technicians who understand finish line margin placement. So it's very important. So that's why I think these fixtures are very important because uh, they have really solved that situation. For me personally, like I said, this is not the only fixtures that I place. I do place with straight implants, but in areas where, anat where, where anatomy gets in the way of, of achieving screw retention, I think these fixtures are very, very important because uh, they, they, they enable you to have a nice surgery, good primary stability and screw retention at the same time. Uh, one of the biggest benefits of them also is that they do have markers on them. So, uh, you know, it's a very technique sensitive implant. When you're placing this implant, you have to make sure that there's a dimple on the buckle that faces the buckle. There are some lines on the fixture mount. Those lines we will talk about later. Uh, they help to make sure that these implants are placed at the right depth. And as you can see, the screw access hole is coming out of the cingulum. And that is very important to be able to achieve screw retention. And this is the dimple that should be facing the buckle, and we'll talk about this here in a little bit. <clears throat> I think uh, it's not, okay, here we go. And this is the, the screw access hole, which should be facing the palatal uh, part after the implant placement. So uh, you can also apply these fixtures uh, in the posterior area. The 24 degrees can be placed in the anterior wall of the maxillary sinus. 
So when we talk about full arches, you can also apply these fixtures in plants for full arches. But then again, this is another topic that we're not going to get into. I just kind of want to bring it to your attention. So let's look at a case over here. You know, this is before digital dentistry. Uh, so uh, as you can see, uh, the incisal edge position is in the wrong place. You can see on the upper right, uh, upper left patient's upper left side, there's some common thing that needs to be done. I'm just going to kind of go through this case very quickly to show you how screw tension can really give us some really beautiful results. And as you can see, the incisal edge needs to be reduced. And by that same amount that the incisal edge needs to be reduced, crown lengthening has to be reduced to move that gingival margin superior. So the final treatment plan for this case was to extraction of that lateral on the patient's right side, placement of two implants for a four unit bridge, and then uh, fixing that mucal gingival defect on the lower anterior with a four unit ceramic bridge. And uh, this was the treatment plan and a uh, single implant was going to be placed uh, into the top right, uh, top first premolar. When we look at the CT scan topography, again, you know, I, I see so many uh, unnecessary grafting and uh, guided bone regenerations being done because if with images like this, if we get at least five millimeters of um, uh, width, uh, we can place these angled implants and be able to achieve screw retention. So, uh, our plan was to place a uh, coaxis implant here and being able to have that critical thickness of two millimeters of bone on the buckle. So here uh, is the uh, surgery of immediate implant placement, attraction of the lateral, grafting of the lateral, and uh, consecutive crown lengthening that was done uh, at the same time. Tempor temporaries were placed. Um, and uh, the lower anterior teeth were extracted, the Maryland uh, bridge was placed, and then after a few months of uh, immediate loading healing of the upper implants, single implant on the top right was also immediately loaded. Then a, uh, the laterals on the lower were prepped for a four unit ceramic bridge. So this is how we started. This is how we were able to temporize. We take this into the laboratory. At this time I was doing uh, PFM, uh, today, I would make these out of zirconia, and the lower was just a four unit ceramic bridge. The prosthesis was made, uh, decision was ma made to make some veneers on the top left. Um, th these are uh, the frameworks, and some veneers, and some onlays, and some crowns uh, were placed on the canines. The veneers were finished this way, uh, the canines were also finished this way. And as you can see, we can go from a result like this, just in two appointments, to something looking like this, with the immediate loading and immediate placement, with the cause access implants, not having to remove stuff on and off, on and off, with, with the help of multi-unit abutments, and uh, not having to worry about cement retain restorations. Uh, also, the single unit was a screw retain restoration. So we can go from this scenario to this scenario, we can have screw retention, and uh, uh, this case has been in function for roughly about seven years. So we can go from this scenario where the extractions happen and multi-units were placed on coaxis implants. You can see the coaxis implants are placed into the bony housing, but the screw retention is bringing the screw axis holes into the cementum. So this scenario right here can look like this uh, after three or four uh, months. And look at that soft tissue carrier implant stability and we can get results like this. So screw retention for me, uh, uh, allows me to preserve that peri-implant soft tissue. So the criteria that's required for the surgical placement of these uh, coaxis implants is a little bit technique sensitive. We don't have time to go into them right now, but when we do workshop studies, we kind of teach students about how you can place these implants, the coaxis implants. There's a very technique sensitive uh, protocol into placing these access implants, but once you nail it, once you understand the concept of how that screw access hole is supposed to be coming out of the single one because now you're drilling um, with the screw access hole coming out into another hole. So it's a little bit confusing for some people, but once you get it down, it's very easily done and you can have beautiful results with these access implants. So I'm gonna leave the access implants here. Um, and I just wanna jump into back to, into cement retain restorations. Just wanna say one last thing about cement retain restorations before we finish this topic. Every attempt should be made in my opinion into avoiding prefabricated abutments. We must try to control the amount of cements that's in the sockets. I'm sure only you agree to that. Uh, the, if you're gonna do cement retain restorations, then you must have the ideal retention and resistance form. And I'll talk a, bit, a little bit about that. And also the placement and the way a 
finish line is placed on some manufacturing stress is very important. So avoiding prefabricated abutments is exactly this. I'm sure you have seen these abutments yourself, Omid. Um, you can see that these abutments in America, we call them stock abutments. There is no attention to the finish line. Uh, the finish line pays no attention to the gingival sulcus, for example. And you can see distal to this implant right now, you have to trim or mill or cut that part of the abutment to make room for your prosthesis. So this is not a customized abutment. I see a lot of people using these prefabricated stock abutments and I wouldn't want this in my mouth because these are very, very generic. They are saved for situations where um, uh, implants are placed in the exact right position and the finish line is not very important. But in this uh, situation, as you can see, it, it is very important. Some people have talked about cement protocols where you take your abutment, you apply a little bit of Teflon to emulate the thickness of the cement, you push that into the crown, you remove the crown. Now there's an imprint of the crown inside uh, of the abutment in your, in, in your crown. You fill that with uh, polyvinyl siloxane, any type of PBS, could be medium or heavy body. You take a dowel pin, this could be a, a paper clip. You can push that in there, remove it. Now you have an impression of how the abutment looks like. And then you push it into your crown. You, simply, you put cement in your crown, you push this polyvinyl siloxane, and it oozes the extra cement out. And then you go ahead and you cement your crown. This has, a, has been a technique to be able to control the amount of cement volume. And so it sometimes works, but sometimes you ooze too much cement out and now you have no retention at all. Another thing I like to say about cement retained restorations is that you must make sure that they have the right resistance form and retention form. Sometimes uh, people make these uh, 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 cement retained abutments and they don't have straight perpendicular walls and they taper them too much. And when they taper them too much, what does that lead to? It leads to decementation and crown loosening after a while. Sometimes you can not only add straight walls, but also you So when it comes to cement retained uh, abutments, we have to make sure that they have the right retention form and resistance form because sometimes when we over taper them too much, that can lead to decementation of the crown. So it's very important to have these sort of uh, straight walls with a, with a, with a, with the right taper. Also, we can ask our laboratory technicians. Uh, not only make uh, smooth straight walls, but also we can ask them to put retention grooves into the abutment uh, uh, to, to have an anti-rotational aspect to them. Finally, I'd like to talk about the finish line placement. And I think Omid, you as a periodontist 100% agrees with this, um, in, in that the placement of the finish line is very important. And it's not only the placement of the finish line, it's also the angle of the finish line that is formed between the finish line and the emergence profile. So that angle right there that the, that the finish line forms between the emergence profile and the finish line itself leads to cement extrusion. So it's very important to have this discussion with the laboratory technician and to explain to them that they must be able to create an undercut of an angle that's formed between the, the placement of the finish, uh, finish line placement and also the emergence profile because that leads to uh, cement extrusion. So it's very important to be able to have that discussion. So here's a case for cement retained restoration of, of uh, restoration of the upper left canine and the implant was placed. And here's a final abutment, cement retained. And you could see the right finish line placement. And when we look at it in the mouth, that's finish line is so super gingival that there's really no way for you to be able to push cement into that sulcus. And so we can get, have beautiful results as this for, with long-term stability. This is another case that I did uh, some time back. Again, a, a cat cam uh, abutment with the right finish line placement. You could see the super gingival finish line. You can see the undercut that's formed between uh, the emergence profile that's underneath the sulcus and the finish line. And at cementation, this is actually three years after, you could actually see the margin so super gingival 
but because the color is zircon a zirconia, it doesn't really uh, show and most patients don't even notice. But you could see if that cement oozes out of there, you could just clean it and you don't have to worry about cement extruding into the sulcus. So only before I carry on into my next step, I want to hear a little bit about what you have to say about cement retained restorations uh, very quickly. I'm sure you, you have some experience of it. Um, sure, sir. So one of the things first I wanted to ask uh, was the case in the anterior maxilla, the case that you extracted the uh, two samples and the left lateral and the right lateral also. And you place your implants at the area of number eight ten. Right, sanitizer. Yeah. In this case. So, one of my first questions uh, regarding the planning is that why did you decide to implants in the area of central and lateral and not placing implants in the area of two laterals? Yeah, you can certainly do that, but um, you know, in this case, I felt like I didn't want to run into a situation where I would not be, a, where I would be placing an immediate implant. Uh, I felt like uh, by placing an implant in the healed ridges, I'll be able to have the primary stability that I wanted. So prosthetically, it doesn't matter. But sometimes, however, I have seen this happen, that you want to place implant bridges and where are in the laterals and then the pontics are in the central, like you mentioned, you can do that. But what if the canine uh, roots come inwards and you have the chances of hitting the root tip. And because I use long implants for immediate loading, you need to lose long implants, sometimes 15. Sometimes you run the danger of being able to hit the apex of the canine. So that's very important. And also, uh, I just, uh, to me, prosthetically, it doesn't really matter because I can lever uh, that pontic of the lateral. So it doesn't really matter to me. Some Sometimes, you know, you're placing implants, you want to place them in the laterals and can't leave in the centrals, but then the lateral areas, the implants are so thin that you know when you place it, you won't have the critical thickness, the two millimeters of bone that we talk about. So that's why I do not have any problems with changing position. I much rather have good bone and good stable uh, uh, peri-implant soft tissue, uh, uh, peri-implant hard tissue seal around my fixture than, than, than to be able to put a bridge that looks good to me to my eyes because prosthetically I know I can fix that with, with pontic space. And also because of the pontic space here underneath the lateral, because this being an extraction socket, I felt like I could do a better job with developing the, ponter, uh, the pontic space underneath an extraction socket than a heel bridge. So there is a difference for you for, for shaping the papillas between the pontics or the cantilever. So both way works for you. I think so too, and I think, it, it, like I said, I think my primary decision making is having the most amount of bone around my implants. I mean, you as a periodontist have seen so many problems arises when that bone is thin, and you know there's there's a lot of studies uh, that show the more bone that you have buckled to your implant, the more long term stability of that bone long term. So I'd rather have something that will last me a long time and be able to have a bridge that looks ideal. And one of the things also you mentioned at the beginning of the presentation was uh, the interocclusal limits for retained crowns. And you mentioned with six millimeters interocclusal height and go with the screw retained restorations and there won't be any problem. So one of my concerns, just as a question, yeah, that slide. Um, if we have that, of the space, like six millimeters. Uh, is it okay for the lab technician to cover that screw access hole? And in, in case, I, I just want to make it example like a PFM crown or a screw with the titanium about it. So one of the problems usually in uh, short interval spaces is that uh, you can see that darkness of the abutment to the porcelain or, or zirconia at the top. So in that limited amount, amount of space, is it okay to cover that? Is there any technique or you forced to see the screw access hole at the occlusal part? 
Um, so are you talking about um, it showing like aesthetically you don't you don't want you don't want that showing no. good question so you know in the past when we used to do pfms we didn't really have a choice but to have that metal showing there were some techniques by filling by putting teflon in the chamber and then filling that chamber of that metal chamber chamber with opaque uh, uh, composites and also beveling the top of the screw access. So if the screw access was like this, we were beveling the top a little bit by being able to trim the top of the screw access hole and then you would cover that with some opaque composites. But today, because we have monolithic zirconia abut uh, crowns, and because it's one solid crown with no layered porcelain, they are so strong that we can make the whole thing out of zirconia. So I think that problem has been really fixed because not too many people do PFMs anymore. And, and what about the abutment? If we put a zirconia crown, so we need to have a zirconia abutment or no? So, so if it's a screw retained restoration, um, this is something that we'll talk about a little bit. So yeah, the abutment um, can be like a tie base, but the zirconia is so opaque that it pretty much covers it. And then the chamber of the abutment can be slightly shorter, maybe like a half a millimeter shorter. So the top will only be zirconia, so it won't really show. And in the case of the screw cement crowns, uh, those you mentioned for making it easier to have a screw retain restoration, but at the same time being able to uh, have the crown cemented on top of that. You know what I'm saying? A screw cement. Yeah, yeah. So in yeah, let's hold that. To the end, I'm, I'm going to show you. Um, I, it's exact, that's a, your question is perfect because I'm actually going to address that and I'm going to talk about that because there is a technique towards the end of this presentation that I'm going to go over and you're going to uh, understand what I'm talking about. Okay. okay. One final question for this part. Uh, yeah. For them that want, want to have a cement, uh, cement retention crowns on implants, do you recommend uh -huh. them? with the temporary cement or permanent cement? So, um, that's, a, that's a very good question. Um, and uh, many people will answer this question uh, differently. Um, I don't have a whole lot of experience with cement retained restorations because I don't do a lot of them. But I do know that there's many different uh, techniques out there. Some people recommend using a temporary cement. You can do that, but then you run the risk of it becoming loose. But if the resistance form and the retention form is good, if the, if the walls are very parallel and you have a lot of inner pools of space, I think temporary cement will be just fine. I don't think you would have any problems but you just have to make sure that you're able to clean it. For example, some temporary cements such as zinc oxides, they set and they're very thick, so you may not be able to get complete seating. Mm -hmm. Some people use resin, uh, resin cements, but when you're using resin cements, you've got to make sure that maybe your resin cement can have uh, radio opacity uh, so that if it does, if you do get some uh, cement extrusion into the sulcus, maybe you can pick it up on the x-ray and you can fix it before it's too late. So, so yeah, there's many different techniques, but it all depends also on the occlusal height, uh, interocclusal height, and also the retention form. If you have nice parallel walls with the right taper, I don't care what you cement it with, it's not going to come loose, especially if you tighten it and you get yourself a nice preload. Okay, great. You can continue now. So what, has your, uh, what is your level of uh, uh, um, preference? Are you more towards cement retained or screw retained restoration? Well, actually, in, uh, in our practice, and usually in Iran, we go both. We don't have like uh, clinicians that totally with screw retained or totally with cement retained. Generally speaking, most of the here goes with cement retained. But in aesthetic area, definitely our choice is a screw retain, an aesthetic zone. And uh, also, as you mentioned, in cases that we have not enough interocclusal space, definitely the choice and the full to going with the screw retain. But I think that it all depends to a good lab technician. And 
with screw retain restorations, it's very important to have a good lab technician. And if, if, if you have a good lab technician, maybe you can go with a screw retain restoration in almost all the cases. But at least in my, Absolutely. In my country, if, if the lab technician is not very good and very precise in restoration, then it will be a headache for a dentist. So I think that's one of the one. Absolutely. Also, the conditions here goes with the cement return restoration. On this, it's a it's, it's a steady case. Right, I agree with you 100. percent And like I said, you know, uh, majority of my cases are screw retained because I'm a prosthodontist. I know how to. Uh, tell lab technicians to make them that way. And also with my implant placement, I'm sort of, um, uh, you know, setting myself up for screw retention. But I'm, but I'm not saying cement retain restrations are not good. They are good, they, should, they could work fine. But, you know, these are some of the principles you should um, apply for. You should avoid prefabricated abutments. You should control the cement volume. You should have the ideal retention and resistance form. And then also the position of your finish line should push for cement extrusion. So yes, like you said correctly, it all depends on the laboratory technician. And so it's very important for dentists to give this information to the laboratory technician to be able to have a conversation about these topics. So yes, I agree with you 100% on that. All right, so let's carry on uh, with my second um, area and that is the emergence profile. And I think as a periodontist, uh, I think you agree to that. So, you know, we can do the most beautiful surgery, like I mentioned earlier in the seminar, but then if you have the wrong profile, like a reverse platform switch in this area, you can really cause a lot of damage and you can destroy that uh, soft tissue and hard tissue peri-implant health. So we can lead, that can lead to crest of bone loss. That can really be a problem. So we can start with a situation like this where the implant is placed and then because the... Uh, uh, crown didn't have the right profile, you can really le lead uh, into some bone loss that probably leads to periimplantitis and probably you'd have to remove that implant and place another one where this could have been just avoided if the prosthesis had the right profile. So it is very important to choose the right abutment. So as you yourself, you may know, Omid, a lot of people use tie bases nowadays. I'm sure you've heard of these abutments called tie bases. Almost everybody's using tie bases. Tie bases to me, as I'll mention it a little bit later, it is nothing but a pre prefabricated abutment. It's just a prefabricated stock abutment. And the problem with them is, is that they come in different heights. So it's, if you are going to use tie bases, it is very important to choose the right tie base with the right height. As you can see the image on the left, as to image on the right, the image on the left has a 0.6 millimeters of, of a height, where the image on the right has three millimeters. So each one of the scenarios can lead into different scenarios. So, so the, the smaller on the right has a three millimeter tie base, but the uh, premolar on the left has the 0.6 millimeter tie base, which can lead into bone encouragement and uh, ventral crest or bone loss. So it's very important to notice that because that little bit of encouragement into biologic width can really lead to bone loss. By, ha by having a platform of the tie baits that's higher, you can avoid situations like that. So it's very important to have this conversation with the laboratory technician and ask them, what tie base are you gonna use here? How tall is the finish line on your tie base? It's very important to have this conversation. And unfortunately, we're not doing that. Now as a periodontist, this should make a lot of sense, right? Because this just goes back to the 1980s and 1970s literature on um, uh, amalgam overhang, right? Encrunching into the biologic width, disturbing that, that, that area. It's very similar. You can do that with the wrong abutment, or you could do that with the, with the wrong profile on your crown, which can lead to eventual bone loss and problems. And I'm sure you have seen that. So it's really the same thing. A lot of people can call emergence profile a biologic width. I don't, call what, I don't care what you call it but it's very important to, to pay attention to that. Now, the depth of the implant placement, I think comes in hand in hand with this emergence profile because you cannot have the right emergence profile if the implant is not deep enough. That's why it's very important to have the implant at the right height. 
Dr. Rojas um, uh, showed us uh, this paper in 2013 in the Journal of Prosthodontics, is a very famous pr uh, prosthodontist in University of North Carolina, where he talks about the depth of the implant placement with the 3A, 2B rule. The 2B applies for the amount of buccal bone, and then the 3A applies to the position of the implant uh, uh, chronoapically. So the implant has to be three millimeters deeper. Because when we don't do that, we run into situations like this, because now the laboratory technician does not know where the height of the implant is. So he tries to emulate the cervical area for you, where when you place that into the implant, you can really lead into the problems that we have seen with crest or bone loss and also food accumulation. So when you see a situation like this, when you see a crown like this that looks like this, um, of course it's frustrating, but, but maybe this implant is not deep enough, right? I mean, when we see this, the first thing that goes into your head is, oh my God, this laboratory technician doesn't know what they're doing. But what if it was our fault? What if this implant was not placed deep enough? And Omid, as you could see over here, if this implant was a little bit deeper, then you can see that we can have a better emergence profile than the, the emergence profile that was placed exactly. Because now that the implant is deeper, you can, you can have the right profile starting um, uh, and you have more running room, as we sometimes say. It is very important to have the fixture at the right height then. So it is important to write, to use a fixture that gives you those inform that information uh, when you're doing um, sort of um, uh, flaplet surgery. For example, this case uh, that was uh, given to me by Dr. Chu, uh, you can you see that these fixtures have these lines, these laser welded lines right on to the, uh, the uh, platform. And so by burying that line, the second line at the gum line, that means that the implant is three millimeters apical. So by having markings on your implants, that can really help. And I think most implant companies today have lines and markings on the, on the fixture mounts and on the implant inserters. So it's very important to pay attention to that because it's very important to bury that implants three millimeters deep uh, in relation to the gingival zenith of the adjacent tech side. So it's very important to have the implants deep enough. Also, I think one of the reasons why we have emergence profile problems is also the width of the implants. Improper fixture, the fixture diameter is very important. So not only the height of the implant is important, also the width of the implant is important because we have seen all the problems that arises when we use narrow diameter implants, especially in the molar area. For example, if you look at this case here, the head of this implant is only two millimeters, right? And uh, that leads into emergence profile problems and it almost looks like a pumpkin on a stick sort of. And also prosthetically, there is, it's very unfavorable, not only mesiodistally, but also buccalingually. So in my opinion, after uh, having many conversations and, and dealing with a lot of these cases, I think it's, it's, it's counterproductive to place narrow diameter implants in molars especially when you have the bone. So I think four millimeter diameter implant is the minimum implant diameter that should be placed in the posterior region because I have seen so many problems. And the problems that do happen requires surgical procedures such as trefining, and that can really lead into the loss of buccal bone and that can really put us in a position that could have been prevented if a wider diameter implant has been placed. So I think emergence profile is also very important if the right diameter is placed. So if you place a four or even a, a, a wider implant that gives you the ability to have the right emergence profile. So nowadays for immediate loading, we even place these wider diameter fixtures called the molar replacement molars, uh, sorry, molar replacement fixtures that, um, that are called the max implants. And this is a separate lecture that maybe you and I can do a webinar on later but they have really changed uh, the ability because now you don't have to worry about coming out and up. You could just directly come out of the fixture and you can close off these embrasure spaces. These, this is a uh, case that was done by Dr. Andrew Aikerman. And one of the biggest complaints of patients with molars uh, in the posterior is, is uh, the uh, food impaction in the um, embrasure spaces. So by having a wider platform, you can avoid having embrasure spaces. And so these, Fixtures uh, have been done by Dr. Andre Hutting and, and uh, Andrew Ekerman and Dr. Kostan Nikolopoulos. A lot of people are placing these wide diameter implants and they have really fixed the profile issues for us. 
And profile is so important that Dr. Chavez and I wrote a paper in the Clinical Advances in Periodontics in 2013 talking about this and how it is important to have the right profile. Sometimes uh, laboratory technicians make unnecessary uh, bulges and ridge lapping onto these crowns where it's not necessary and it makes it very difficult for patients to clean and it makes it very difficult uh, to be able to maintain uh, that soft tissue peri-implant health. Yeah. So next, uh, let's talk about biocompatibility. Omijan, did you want to talk about this a little bit? Yeah, uh, the, one of the things that I wanted to mention uh, regarding the tie base heights. So as you yes. know, you have different height of tie bases and very important to choose the right height. So for example, in cases that the, you have a bone level implant and you place it exactly level with the bone, maybe it's good for them to go with six millimeters of tie base height. But in the cases that they place their implant about two millimeters subcrestal, then, for example, in these three scenarios, they should get three millimeter of, I mean, um, tie base height. Make sure yes. that the connection yes. is on top of the bone and not, not putting a pressure on the bone. You're I'm right. You agree with me? Absolutely. 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 I agree with you. So I think, I think one of the one important points that usually uh, an implant surgeon should take into consideration is that uh, choose the type of implants that have different height of tie bases available in that system. Because some of the implants Absolutely. Do not have different height of tie bases and the, the lab technician is forced to go to available tie base and some of the problems can happen. Precisely. So this is the reason why I'm not, I'm, I'm actually not a very big fan of tie bases. I believe in customized cat cam abutments that I will talk about a little bit later. You will see how I do my restorations. I think one of the reasons why people use a lot of tie bases, maybe a little bit of cost and maybe the, the ease, the availability because they're so available. But I think if you have a system that doesn't have the right height of tie bases and you're forced to use like for example the image on the top left maybe you can take a diamond wheel or something and you can get rid of that uh, uh lip there and start the profile from the finish line higher so so you are absolutely right that that we need to talk to the surgeons we need to have conversations with the laboratory technicians we need to talk to each other as a group to be able to avoid uh situations like this i 100 percent agree with you and um Speaking of emergence profile, because you demonstrated beautifully uh, the, the shapes and how they should be formed, uh, do you prefer to go with the concave profile um, subgingively or it depends on the I mean, the subgingival. So are you, talking, are you talking about immediate placement and immediate loading or are you talking about healed ridges? No. In both, actually, in immediate placement or in healed regions, in the cases that you want to form the tissue. So usually, yeah. in healed regions, we can go with the customized abutments and just increase them layer by layer. To or with some systems like cervical. Uh, but in immediate cases, it's different because if we go with very convex profile, we may face. If we go with the very con profile you may face a collapse so i just want to know uh your your opinion and your thoughts on that that how do you choose what extent to form the subjunctival emergence profile of your future crown so let's talk about healed ridges for a moment so when it comes to healed ridges um i, I think one of the ways that I personally do it, and obviously uh, some people may disagree with this, is when I place, especially in the posterior area, a implant in the healed ridge, I use very wide healing abutments, very wide healing caps, the widest that I can. Uh, if I'm platform switching, great. But I, I'm against using these very small uh, diameter healing abutments. So when the patient heals after two, three months, that emergence profile has already been done for me. Maybe I should make a slide, for the slide about that because there are implant companies that they have healing abutments that come out of the bone and then they, convert, they, they diverge correctly 
and then they have impression copings that have the exact same profile. And then they have abutments that have the exact same profile. So you could actually build yourself up that to that from the very early stage from the implant placement. So that's the way I do it. I use the right healing abutments with the right impression copings and the right abutments. They all have the same sort of emergence profile. So that's how I do it in the, in the, uh, in the post on the heel ridges. When it comes to immediate loading, also with immediate loading, I try to do flap surgeries and atraumatic surgeries. So a lot of the times that sulcus is already the way it is. That socket, that extraction socket is already the way it is. So when I take an impression after immediate placement, I go into the lab and I tell my technicians to try to emulate that as much as they can. But like you said, mentioned earlier, maybe in the beginning a little bit straight and then sort of diverge. And so that's the way I do it. I try to copy exactly what nature has given me. I'm not really into um, sort of this in the box soft tissue engineering. What about the Say that again? The S-curve. S-curve in the buckle. So if you go completely convex. Yeah. So, so I think it should be concave uh, to allow for peri-implant soft tissue. I think in certain instances where you need to push that soft tissue a little bit yes maybe and I think Dr. Chu uh, has uh, published a couple of papers about that and I know yourself talk about this a lot and I think it's case by case uh, also and also the depth of the implant is very important too uh, so so yes I, I think the buckle should be more of a concave uh, situation uh, than more of a convex unless if you need to push that tissue a little bit but I, I think it's better to go by nature. I think you should just follow the natural anatomy of the socket, maybe slightly increasing it a little bit to compensate for dieback later on. But I will show some cases at the end where the one abutment, one time concept that we used to do in the same day with Dr. Costa, and that was just to put a final restoration at the day of the surgery. And we never disturbed that peri implant soft tissue health. And so maybe we'll talk about that here a little bit. Uh, did you want me to carry on or did you want to talk about this a little bit more? Sorry, I didn't hear you. Yeah, you can continue now. Okay. So let's dive into the next topic, which is soft tissue um, biocompatibility. A lot of people don't talk about this because, you know, like I said, you can have the right implant, you can do the right surgery. But what is the material that we're placing in the sockets? And, and, I, and I want you to actually give me a lot of feedback on this. And I want to see what you think about this. Because the success of an implant is not only osteointegration. It's also the maintenance of that bone stability and soft tissue health over long term. So the materials that we place into our sockets once the implant has integrated, what is that material? Um, is it titanium? Do you use gold? Do you use base metal, zirconium, aluminum oxide, porcelain, lithium disilicate? What should be lining that sockets? I mean, right from the fixture, as soon as you come out of the fixture, and as soon as you come out of the sockets, what material lines that peri-implant tissues before you come into the oral environment? And that's a very good question. And there are many materials out there, but the question is, what is the best material that is going to be in proximity to the sockle epithelium, to the junctional epithelium, and to the connective tissue. So, so you can put any material you want. In the past, we used to put a lot of gold. We used to do a lot of custom abutments. So that, that area used to be surrounded by gold. And so, you know, there, are, there is a lot of incredible amount of research about how we can maintain that bone by sort of doing platform switching to the, to the head of the implant, to the head of the fixture, by laser welding, surface of the implants. But what about uh, the soft tissue material? Um, what about the material that's gonna be in proximity to the soft tissue? Which one of these scenarios is more favorable? Would the selection of the right abutment material lead to the image to the right as opposed to the image to the left? What material is gonna give us better hemodosmazole soft tissue attachment into that area. So, so there's a lot of materials out there, but 
And I think everybody knows that one of the best materials out there is probably zirconia. Uh, Thomas Linkovicius talks about this extensively. You know, the image on the left is biofilm accumulation. The image on the right is uh, zirconia. And th this was a, a study where they attached these devices uh, onto the molars of patients and they had the patients function and then they removed these de devices and they looked for accumulation and bacteria always accumulated more heavily on titanium as it did to uh, zirconia. And I think that has to do with the surface roughness. And because zirconia gives us the ability to have a very smooth surface, bacteria tends to attach to it less. So let me paint a scenario for you, Omid. You place an implant, and you want to restore a crown on top of that. You call your laboratory technician, you tell the technician, please make me a zirconia crown. And what does that technician do? Uh, they take a tie base, right? They take a tie base, they place a zirconia uh, coping or a, a framework on top of that, and then they make you a crown. But now that crown has glazed zirconia all over it. Where is the zirconia? You paid for a zirconia crown. Again, tie base, zirconia coping, and a glazed porcelain crown on top of that. Where is the zirconia? There is no zirconia. The zirconia is deep down into the crown, but you already paid for a zirconia. So it's a very important conversation to have with your technician because can we do, it, can we do something like this, right? Can we have limited amount of titanium? We can have the right finish line placement, have polished, smooth, highly polished zirconia in, in areas where there is soft tissue uh, attachment. And then on top of that, you could do whatever you want. You could do gold, you could do porcelain, you could do glazed porcelain, whatever, Emacs, whatever needs to be done. And so it's a very good question to ask, how much zirconia is in the sulcus too? Because we see these really high tie bases, right? That's why I don't like these tie bases because it, it it makes you use too much tie base. So my preference is, is have the least amount of titanium and the most amount of zirconia. And I will show that a little bit. So the image you see on the top right is what I prefer. 0.6 millimeters of titanium and the rest should be all zirconia. And I will show how we can achieve that. In the past, this is a zirconia, all zirconia crown that I did where the connection was zirconia. But then later on, people came and said, that may be reaming the inside and they may lead to titanium tattooing and some titanium particles coming into the sulcus. So we no longer do that. We use a titanium interface, but my recommendation is make that interface as minimum as possible and make the zirconia as maximum as possible. And that zirconia should be highly smooth, polished zirconia right over there. So how do you, how do, you do that? It's very easy. I'm gonna show you a video. Uh, so this is a regular zirconia. Uh, abutment, the way you polish them is you use these wheels. So this is a centered zirconia with before it being uh, polished. All you have to do is you have to go through these different types of wheels that go from uh, coarse to medium coarse to fine and then a, 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 a diamond luster. And you can really bring them into a smoothness. So all you need is a Z-Shine diamond polish kit and these different types of diamond impregnated wheels that are specially made for polishing zirconia. And you can see the difference, right? Same abutment, once it's polished, look at that surface smoothness. It almost looks like glass. You could see your own face in it, right? It's really smooth. So, so my recommendation is very highly smooth zirconia because it has the right surface roughness to be able to avoid the accumulation of bacteria. And you could actually teach this to your laboratory technician, right? Uh, you can tell your technician, what I want you to do is I want you to mark with a pencil where the sulcus would end, and then you take these wheels, and then you polish everything below that wheel. Very easy to achieve, and a very easy instruction to give your technicians. And if your technicians cannot do that or are incapable of it, or they don't have the wheels, you can actually buy these wheels and you can have them in your office. And once the crown comes back, if you see any glaze uh, uh, zirconia or if you see any porcelain, just take a wheel, coarse, medium, fine, and just er erode that away. Make sure that there is no zirconia next to the sulcus. Did you want to talk about that a little bit, uh, Omid, uh, before I carry on? Because um, I'm going to move into uh, the fit of the implant. Yeah, I think, I think the point that you mentioned is uh, one of the most critical parts in uh, in uh, especially speaking of 
tissue adherence and the stability of the outcome regarding the prosthetic point of view. And uh, also, as you mentioned, uh, in the zero bone loss, co bone loss concept uh, by Thomas Linkevich, is also, it's really been focused on highly polished zirconia uh, in the gingival area. So the thing that uh, I think it makes the dentist job very easy to have a lab in their office, I think. One of, the, one of the things that may stop them doing that is that you don't want to just send the crown back to the lab and ask for polishing it. So maybe it's very good, to, good idea to have that kit and to know how to make it polished and how to adjust it. And then um, even you're saving more time because sending the crown back and then send, lab send it back to you because usually it takes time. So maybe one of the reasons that they want to just end everything very fast is uh, that they don't want to send it back. So one of the other reasons, other options is that to educate, as you said, educate the lab technician to know exactly what you want and how to end the finish line with the porcelain or how should be the height of the zirconia, as you mentioned, by marking the uh, finishing line or Marking the, marking the level of the gingival margin so that the lab technician know exactly where, should, where, where the area should be polished. Yeah. I, I agree with you 100%, but let me just make a, a, a very small remark about that. I have had this discussion with, uh, with a couple of my friends about having an in-house laboratory technician. Here in, in America, particularly, it's very difficult to have a laboratory technician in the office because of the cost, right? So uh, to have a seasoned technician in your office can be expensive. And it can also take away from you being able to concentrate on patient care because now not only you have to run your clinical office, you also have to run a laboratory. So it becomes very difficult for, for some doctors. But to be able to achieve what you want is very easy, right? I mean, polishing zirconia by yourself or teaching someone to do it is very simple, right? So you can, you can buy these wheels, you can send someone to, to a, a, a small laboratory course where they can learn how to do that, or you can send one of your staff to one of your favorite laboratories for a day or two so they can teach them how to polish their cone. It is not very difficult. And also uh, maybe having a laboratory technician that understands these concepts will send you crowns that this is already done. All you have to do is take your laboratory technician out for lunch, sit down for them and talk with them and say, listen, this is how I want them to be done. From now on, please put this in your records that whenever I send the crown, I want uh, to have the minimum amount of the tie base, which we will talk about how you can achieve that. And I want the maximum amount of poly zirconia. And um, I want the area of the peri implant sulcus to be uh, lined up with maximum amount of polished uh, zirconia. So, so my answer to you is yes, it would be nice to have a technician, but if it's not possible to do that, it's very easy. Uh, all you just need is to have some of these burrs. The burrs have improved so much. Some of these wheels, they, they come in kits and um, you just buy them. They're so easy to do. And, uh, you know, maybe we can, we can do a course on that one time. And so so it's not right. how to do it. It's very simple. Yeah, in this case that you're showing now on the slide, it's a semen retained crown. Yeah. So, in the case of semen retained, uh, do you ask the lab technician to put the gingival margin, you know, to put the finishing line at the level of gingival, right? Yes. So, can we, so one of the options maybe is that to ask the lab technician to send you the abutment, so you mark exactly for them where you want to be the polished area and you send the, send the abutment back to the lab and then they will send you the crown and the polished um, area of the abutment for you. So it will be three sessions. One impression, second- You can do it. Yeah? Yeah, you can absolutely do that. But you know, as you know uh, about me, I like to see patients as least amount of possible. I like to finish things quicker. So if, if you work with a technician that understands these, 
then it shouldn't be a problem. Um, and also in this, in this case in particular, um, uh, you know, they have the model and now even with CAD CAM, they, sh they should be able to mark where the saltus would end and they should be able to polish it themselves. And like I, like I mentioned earlier, even if they haven't done it, you could do it yourself. I, I really don't think it's that complicated to be able to do that. Good, good, So let's move on to my final part of what goes into having the right abutment and that is to have the right fit, right? So this is something that only not a lot of people actually talk about or think, what is the right fit, right? Does it really even matter, right? So this was an animal study that was done in 2003 that talked about the micro gap, how the micro gap can cause microbial leakage. And that microbial leakage, that sustained microbial leakage can lead to neutrophil accumulation and that chemotactic uh, stimuli over time when it's combined and sustained with inflammatory cells can lead into the activation of osteoclasts and that could essentially lead into bone loss. So there's a lot of studies out there that talk about how microgap can lead into bone loss over time. So having the right fit definitely helps reducing the amount of bone loss over time. I Unfortunately, the literature is not so solid on this topic itself, but I have made it a habit in my mind that no matter what happens, no matter what case I'm restoring, I want to give the best fit possible on every case. Whether it matters or does not matter, that's the way I do it. That's the way uh, I can control uh, my patients and, and to be able to give the same consistent fit to every case that I do matters for those patients that have compromised peri-implant uh, immune system, patients that are uh, patients that have history of periodontitis by having a good fit and by reducing the micro gap, you can maybe run into a situation where you can have a cleaner and more uh, uh, sort of stable peri-implant soft tissue health over long term. And so you may ask, and you say, Safa, what are some of the things that can lead to a bad fit? I mean, how can you get a bad fit? Let me give you an example, Omid, and this is very interesting. You know that there are three types of abutments. There are prefabricated stock abutments. We talked about this, right? The image on the left is a stock abutment. We have seen them many times. Some people you make, um, stock abutments that are ceramics, and I'll talk maybe if we have time about the middle one later, and I'll show some cases that I use them, but these are very good only for external connection, for internal connection, having a zirconia going straight to the implant is not a good idea, but with external, we have had some really high success. And then you have the tie base, right? So this you understand, these are prefabricated abutments. Are you with me so far? Okay, now, then we have CAT cam abutments. CAT cam abutments, have been around over a decade or so. The only problem with them is that they're a little bit expensive, they're technique sensitive, and you need the right machinery, and you need to have a laboratory technician that understands that, or you need to be able to do them in-house. Today, they're becoming more and more prevalent because CAT CAM technology is entering offices, so maybe the future are with these guys, but the right now, they could be a little bit expensive. And then the old school traditional custom abutment or the UCLA, right? I mean, you're familiar with these UCLA abutments, the gold abutments, everybody knows these. I mean, not a prosthodontist goes through residency without having to deal with custom abutments and gold abutments. Let's talk about custom abutments for a moment. We all remember, remember from pro school in, in that you took the custom abutments, either they were plastic sleeve or they had a gold connection to them, the UCLA cast to gold, which came later because we had so many problems with the image on the left with plastic screws because they were completely subjected to casting procedures. Right, Omid, you as a periodontist may not have seen some of this, but can you imagine having a crown that goes through casting, investing, de-investing, sandblasting, heat treating and polishing and even after all of this was done, the oxidation that happened from uh, at the burnout and the ceramic firing, and to be able to remove that oxidized layer led to an abutment that was no longer so pristine. It was an abutment that no longer looked like the abutment that came out of the factory. I know the cast to gold abutment helped a little bit, the image on the left, as opposed to the plastic UCLA that was done back in the 80s, but still, 
it did go through laboratory procedures and I'll show a couple of cases where it did that. So when it, connection of an abutment looked like this before laboratory processing, after laboratory processing, it looked terrible, right? It was degraded. It was changed in dimension. It was no longer the same. So it doesn't matter. I think so. I mean, look at this image, for example. First of all, there is no fit here. And look at the biofilm accumulation that has happened. So too many implants, and then we just do the right fit. We section them into four, uh, four three unit bridges. And in one month, look how better the tissue looks, right? So the fit does matter because that biofilm right, sits right on top of the implant and it causes a problem. So a processed, gold, a processed gold cylinder looks horrible after laboratory degradation. Let me look at, show you an example, okay? I did this a month ago. This was a crown that I sent to a commercial laboratory in the United States, right here, a very famous laboratory that does hundreds of uh, um, uh, crowns. When you look into zooming, look how this laboratory has degraded that connection. That connection is no longer pristine, as you can see it, right? I mean, look at the image on the top right. You see that blob right there uh, with the top arrow? What is that? Is that just a piece of scrap metal that's attached in there? Can that affect your fit? Can that affect your preload, right? When I'm talking about preload, uh, preload is when you put the crown on and the fit is so great, you take your prosthetic screw and you torque your prosthetic screw to 32 or 45, depending on the implant manufacturer. And by holding that preload for about six seconds or so, you're making a cold weld to take place between the connection and the implant. And that connection is pristine, it's tight, it's perfect. It's up to four or five or six or seven or 10 micron of fit, depending on the implant manufacturer. So I owe this to this man called Andrew Aikman, who's a prosthodontist in Johannesburg who invented the passive abutment, right? You've heard Dr. Costa and me talk about this passive abutment many times. Maybe right now I could, I could clarify it because it's a, it's, a, it's a difficult topic to understand from my experience in the past seven years trying to teach this abutment. It's a very difficult concept to understand. So bear with me, I'll try my best to, to, make, it, to make you understand. So let's say this is how it's done. So in order to make sure that that connection is pristine and that connection is not subjected to laboratory degradation, First, you apply that titanium ring. It's a 0.6 millimeter ring in, in thickness. You apply that and you secure that with a plastic screw. On top of that, you do your casting. Are you with me so far? So you do your casting, you wax up, whatever. You could cat cam that part that could be made out of zirconia, whatever. Then you cement that casting with that line in yellow over onto the passive abutment, that interfacial ring. Once you're done with that, then you remove the passive screw and then you apply your titanium or gold prosthetic screw that clamps the prosthesis. Do you see the edges of the screw on top clamping the prosthesis to the fixture? And all that titanium ring that you saw, all that is doing is that it's acting as like a washer, right? And the prosthetic screw is clamping the final prosthesis to the implant and clamping that cement space. Bear with me, and I think you can ask a lot of questions about this and we'll understand it. But what it is doing is that that passive abutment is attached to the prosthesis with that yellow cement line. But because of the clamping effect of that prosthetic screw, boom, it brings it down and then the prosthetic screw, prosthetic screw clamps the final prosthesis. What you're getting is that you're getting a four micron pristine fit between that titanium ring and the implant. It's a machine fit to a machine fit. It's an interfacial uh, ring that it, that, it is, that it is secured by the preload and it's a titanium to titanium and you're eliminating all the inaccuracies of the manufacturing process, whether it's zirconia, whether it's casting or whatever it is because that interfacial titanium ring has never gone through the laboratory uh, degradation, it's a pristine fit. It's a machine to machine fit. What I mean by preload is applying preload at the fixture. So this is a screw retained restoration by uh, making sure that the crown is first screwed on and then applying 45 or 30 uh, Newton centimeters of torque and holding there, holding there for six seconds. If you have a very perfect fit, if the fit is pristine, 
if the fit is really nice and, and precise, you can hold that to 40. That's almost giving you like a pristine uh, a fit and a preload that causes a cold weld to happen. The problem that happens when you don't do this is the reason why we see a lot of screw loosening. So in cross section of this crown, you can see that uh, the, 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 the cement space is clamped by the prosthetic screw clamping the prosthesis and causing a machine to a machine fit. And that's highlighted in the yellow is the passive abutment. So what the fit looks like underneath an electroscope, uh, electron microscope is pristine, four microns uh, or less, sometimes 1.27 microns. But Omid, here's a slice, slide that I want you to pay attention to. It's very important. So look at the image on the left. The first image, on the bottom is the implant. Then the, on top of that, that's an engaging passive abutment for an internal hex implant. And the way that implant prosthesis is retained to the implant is the clamping screw, uh, is the clamping effect of the screw on top. Um, but so the image on the middle is, a, is, a, is the problem that people understand because people think that that prosthesis is held on to the implant by just that little tie base, and that is not true. So the image in the middle is wrong. The image on the right is what it looks like, right? So, so the prosthesis is held on to the implant by the clamping of the screw and by not by that little passive above it. I don't know if that makes sense. Do you understand this, this part over here? Omijan, did you hear me? Did you understand this part over here before I proceed? Do you have any questions about this uh, clamping and this passive abutment? It's okay, it's good. You understand, okay. So it's very important to understand that because a lot of people think that that passive abutment is what's uh, holding the crown, is what's uh, sort of providing the retention and that is not true. The retention is coming from the prosthetic screw clamping inside of the zirconia or the prosthesis and the zirconia has to have the right dimensions and we can talk about that a little bit. Here's an example of the tie base and a full monolithic zirconia uh, on a trilobe implant, cement space is done, cemented and then screwed on and, and tightened and secured. And here's another example of a tie base. So that little sliver of titanium that you see, that's a 0.6 millimeters of thickness of the, of the tie base. And the second arrow you see on top of that, that is all polished zirconia. And look at that bone level, look at that soft tissue barrier. So, so all of that soft tissue uh, is lined up by fully monolithic polished zirconia. And the tie base gives us a pristine two micron fit clamped in by the prosthetic screw, torqued to 45 newton centimeters of torque, and that implant is stable. That connection is not only clean, that, in, that connection has the right soft tissue lining to, uh, to a polyzirconia, that connection is also very pristine. It has only up to a two micron of fit, which would the passive abutment provide. It has the least amount of titanium and the most amount of zirconia. So this is how I do my single crowns which I mentioned earlier how I do my single crowns. So this is a slide that I received from Dr. Andrew Ekerman, again, showing the passive abutment on an external hex. You can see the minimum amount of titanium and the maximum amount of zirconia, very beautifully done. And uh, so we can do that. So I'm gonna skip over this slide over here to proceed. And uh, so when we talked about how much zirconia do we need, maximum amount of zirconia, minimum amount of titanium, and that's what the passive abutment looks like. You can do on top of that whatever you want. This is a case that was done by Dr. Andrew Ekerman, and there's many different ways that you could do it, but the most important thing to realize is that the thickness of that interfacial titan uh, titanium passive abutment is only about 0.6 millimeters in, in height, and the rest is all zirconia. Look at all that polyzirconia, and then on top of that, you could do whatever you want. And if you look at multiple restorations, you could do the same. And this is a cementation of a passive abutment. Again, uh, cement is applied and look at that fit. Perfect two micron fit. This is a case by Dr. Andrew Ekerman again, nine year follow up of this passive abutment. I know it's a very difficult concept to understand because people think, oh, how can you depend on the prosthetic screw giving you their retention? Well, the prosthetic screw is clamping and engaging passive abutment component into the implant and the clamping effect of the 
prosthetic screw uh, leads into a preload and that preload makes sure that this connection is secure. So this is a very quick video of how the passive abutment is done in the laboratory. So the prosthesis is done outside of the mouth. The passive abutment is secured with the passive screws. You can use any type of cement you want to, to, to cement the passive abutment over the uh, prosthesis, to the prosthesis. So cement is first applied, a very thin line coating is applied to the top of the passive abutment, and then the prosthesis is secured. Care must be done to make sure that the uh, contact point between the three three molars is not too heavy, otherwise it will not seat properly. It's, uh, it's, once it's set, then you just kind of break that off. Uh, this is a video that was given to me by Dr. Ekerman. You break off all that cement, and then you ream it, you clean it, and what it gives you is a pristine fit of a interfacial ring that has not been subjected to laboratory degradation, oxidation of, uh, of the metal, and it just looks clean. You just go in there, remove all the uh, components that are left in there, you ream it, you clean it, and then you secure it. So when I started doing this, then I said, well, why, don't you, why can't we apply this to full arch restorations? And, I, we, and that's absolutely what we did. So uh, the same concept is applied uh, for the passive abutment for cement retained restorations. Uh, sorry, sorry, for full arch restorations. Uh, but uh, the only difference here is that the passive abutment does not have an engaging component. So it's non-engaging. So for full arch restorations right now, I restore most of them. Uh, with the passive abutment and look at these beautiful bone levels that you can achieve uh, because of these uh, connections. That's the passive abutment right there. You could see it in the arrow and the connection is perfect. So for these full arch restorations, you can have a phenomenal two micron fit. And you don't have to worry about zirconia or your zirconia milling machine because as you know that these milling machines have these burrs that are very expensive and they get dull. So when they mill your zirconia, the connection is no longer pristine because you are at the mercy of these burrs. So by having a, a passive abutment that's secured to the, to the model, you don't have to worry about the connection anymore because the connection is a machine fit. One of the biggest problems we have right now with the tie bases, because full arch restorations in the United States and many parts of the world right now is done by the tie base. Well, one of the problems is that when you try to put your prosthesis over the tie base, if you have a very long prosthesis, then you don't have the retention and the resistance form that we talked about, right? So what ends up happening is that you get these decementation. I cannot tell you how many decemented full arch restorations I get. 95% of the work I do right now is full arch implant restorations, as you know, the type of work that Cleatures provides. I do roughly about 40 to 45 um, uh, full arches of zirconia per month. And this cementation is definitely something that we deal with. But we don't have that problem with the passive abutment. Also, what if, if the implant is a little bit angulated? You have a path of draw problem. The prosthesis doesn't seat. But if you have a passive abutment, then boom and then the prosthetic screw goes on top and secures it in place. So you don't have a path of draw problem. So this is how I do my full arches with the passive abutment and we don't get situations like this, we get situations like this. Because once that prosthesis is removed for hygiene or something like that, we want these pictures to look beautiful. We want soft tissues to look pink and, and firm and stippled and, and gorgeous. This is something that we are not able to achieve with the previous connections. So just to wrap it up, you know, it is important to do beautiful surgery, but it's also important to have a prosthetically stable prosthesis that gives you good soft tissue and heart tissue, peri-implant soft tissue health. And, uh, you know, you, you're familiar with the final abutment concept, the one abutment, one concept. So I'm going to end my, my, my presentation with a, a, a case that takes the final one above and one time concept into consideration uh, because we know that uh, there's a couple of studies. Um, this is the one study that showed better marginal bone levels when the final abutment was placed as opposed to when you had multiple abutment placement. So by putting the final prosthesis at the time of surgery and never having to remove it, can that give you better bone levels long-term? Yeah, that is the one above and one concept that many people have talked about. 
Um, so let me just kind of finish up this uh, presentation by giving you an example of how we can do that. Before I show this case, I'd like to say that this is a uh, uh, external hex implant and uh, it was restored with a prefabricated zirconia abutment. These abutments are available uh, for the external hex and I recommend them significantly for the external hex. For the internal hex, I'm not sure if they, that, that would apply. So let's just summarize everything that we've talked about. I'm looking for something that's screw retained. I'm looking for something that's adjustable that my laboratory technician knows how to adjust. I'm looking for something that's heavy duty and it doesn't break. We're looking for something that's biocompatible as we have discussed. We're looking for something that gives us a great fit. Again, Give, looking for, for an abutment that can allow me to platform switch, and I'm definitely looking for something that's readily available. So these are the abutments that I have spoken to you about them recently. Um, they come in different um, uh, emergence profile, and you can see that the third image from the left, the 47, has uh, the least unsupported porcelain. So you have to choose the right one because they come in, the, the connection is the same but the emergence profile is different. So you could see that image with the check mark is the one that's gonna give you the least amount of unsupported porcelain. So we choose that one. They come in very different uh, types of profile, but again, this is for the external hex. Uh, for the internal hex, I would be nervous about taking the cornea directly to the fixture, but with the external hex, because you have a butt joint and you have that hex to depend on, you don't have to worry about it so much. So the benefit of these abutments is that you can take a blank zirconia button and you can take it into a final porcelain fused to zirconia in less than six hours. And that's what we did in Dubai. And this is what this case is going to show. You could also do that in the anteriors as well. The benefit again is that it's zirconia. The fit is perfect. They're readily available and they are adjustable. You can trim them the way you want. And then all you have to do is apply a little bit of zirconia, a little bit of porcelain, zirconia porcelain, of course, uh, with the right uh, um, uh, 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 coefficient of thermal expansion, and then you can have uh, a full full prosthesis that's done in less than six seven hours by a seasoned technician. And this is an implant that I placed with a five year follow up, one abutment one time implant went in. Final restoration work was placed at the day of the surgery. Patient went home. One surgery. The, uh, the consecutive appointments in the future will only follow up and x-ray appointments. And look at that soft tissue peri implant health. She came to me after five years, I removed the implant crown and look at that connection, how clean and beautiful that is. And look at the bone levels after five years. So I'm gonna, uh, before I go to a case, did you want to talk about this? Because I'm gonna wrap up my presentation with this one last case. No, it was, it was really good. So I think it's better to go to the case and then we can have a little discussion at the end. Okay, so this is a case that um, I'm not gonna get into uh, so much uh, surgery, but again, um, you can see that there were some problems associated with this case. The apex has some gutta percha protrusion through the apex. However, the most important thing to realize about this case is that there's a little bit of buccal bone that's still attached. One of the most important things that we must be careful here is not to open a flap. We must try to do this flapper surgery so this, this case is actually, I like it a lot because it summarizes everything that I have talked about in this presentation. So an implant is placed, coaxis implant, the apex of the implant provides the uh, primary stability that we want by engaging the palatal bone. The abutment that goes on top of that is a zirconia abutment that we talked about on an external hex implant. But the most important thing to realize is that the thin buccal bone that's still present uh, right next to the gingival margin, that bone must be preserved. If that bone is preserved, this case can be done flaplessly and it can also be done by the dual zone technique that I have seen yourself talk about so many times. Um, and so let's dive into that. So here's what I want you to look at. Oh, uh, you can see uh, the osteotomy is different than the apex of the implant. This case was done by Dr. Costa. And you can see that the apex uh, is buckled to the, where the osteotomy is prepared. That's why for these coaxis implants, it's very important to follow a strict surgical protocol. So it's important for the implant to be inserted palatally to the, where the apex is. And then the stability starts forming. 
when we talked about burying that implant three millimeters deeper than the gingival zenith of the adjacent side, uh, these fixtures have these lines. You can see that line by the dimple, that line must be in line with the gingival zenith, which means that the implant is gonna be three millimeters apical to the gingival zenith of the adjacent side. So we're gonna have to drive this implant deeper and the dimple has to be placed on the buckle. We need to go deeper. That line has to completely disappear to make sure that the head of the fixture, the platform, is three millimeters apical. So we still have to go a little bit deeper because this fixture is not at the right place. So we go deeper and then when we finish, we have to make sure that that dimple is centered exactly mesially distally and it's exactly uh, pointing out to the buckle. Uh, we remove that and that's a fixture right there. And now that gap has to be filled with some allograft. You can use any type of bone that you want. You know more about this than I do. A little bit of bone milling has to be done on the palatal to make sure that the, that the abutment is going to seat. But that gap right there in this case was filled with allograft and LPRF. There's a cornea abutments that we talked about earlier must be tried in because if there's any bony interference that will not seat. We check a guide to make sure that the abutment is going to give us a screw turn restoration, as you mentioned earlier yourself. The most important thing here is that a flap was not raised and that gap is going to be filled. Now look at, look at that, that abutment. It gives us the least amount of um, unsupported porcelain. We fill that gap with mineralized Kinsella's freeze-dried uh, allograft with LPRF. And in six hours, the final abutment uh, was, uh, an impression was made and the final abutment was cut into the laboratory. And in two weeks follow up, look at that beautiful turnout in just six hours. Now the crown is not the most beautiful crown that you have seen in the world, but uh, let's not forget that this crown was done in six hours by a seasoned technician. And uh, this is the follow up. The patient came back after four years she wanted me to open up the embrasure space, so I opened it up, but look at that. Uh, no surgery was uh, done here. No, I mean, no open surgery was done here. Very minimum surgery, one abutment, one time concept, and the bone levels look phenomenal. Look at that bone that was able to be grown over the fixture, and the results are phenomenal. So I like this case a lot because this case basically summarizes all the stuff that we talked about, school retention, zirconia for biocompatibility, having a good fit. These zirconia abutments give up to 20 microns or less of fit. And uh, also the emergence profile, having the right emergence profile. So I really enjoyed this case because it sort of goes uh, over uh, all of the stuff that we talked about. And that's how it looks after four years in function. This woman only had one surgery and, and uh, she only had one appointment. And then I think that has a lot of merit because I think sometimes we subject patients to unnecessary procedures. And I think we can do the same work by uh, applying atraumatic principles and doing the least. Uh, and as we remember, less is more. Uh, I think this is the end of my conversation about this uh, presentation. Omi John, did you have any questions? Would you like to talk about anything else? Uh, uh, do you have any questions? Uh, you, really, you really went in depth on um, all these parameters which are very important from an aesthetic point of view and for successful stability of the outcome in long term. I thoroughly enjoyed your presentation and everything was super clear. And we had lots of discussion in the middle to make it more interactive. And um, I think you, you mentioned very, very important things. We talked about tie bases. We talked about how important Polish uh, subgingival surface of the abutment, for the zirconia, we talked about the screw retained versus cement retained, and that none of them, is, uh, we can't say 100% that uh, screw retained is completely superior to cement retained or vice versa, but definitely in the aesthetic zone, the preference may be going with the screw retained because we can control uh, from the biological standpoint, the parameters that may affect the outcome and the stability of the tissues. You brilliantly presented the shape of the abutment and how to make sure that we don't have any unsupported porcelain on top of the abutment. And we talked about emergence profile, how important is the shape and the concavity, the convexity. And I think. 
it was pretty clear all the topics. And one of the things that I loved about it is the is the uh, passive fitness of the, of the crowns and most specifically the full arch cases because that's one of the issues that usually I think I'm a surgeon I'm not a foster guy but that's one of the things that usually can lead to complications and as far as I understood also in your presentation, I think the recommendation going to be segmental prosthetics uh, and not uh, not uh, full arch prosthesis one piece. If we don't go with the passive above, right? Can we say that? Um, no, you can you can you can have the passive abutment on and all on six with six implants on um, twelve teeth. It doesn't have to be segmented necessarily. No, you can do the passive abutment for the full arch prosthesis. Now, my question was that in cases that we don't use passive abutments. Okay. So in those cases, we should go segmental, or it's even possible to go with. Uh, uh, that's a that's a, that's a that's a very, very good question, Omi. Uh, phenomenal question. And, you know, I'm doing a, a study uh, club with um, uh, in the future, and I'll, and, I'll, and I'll probably, you'll see some of the postings, and we're going to talk about this. Very good question. Very, very, let me answer you very quickly uh, before we let this go, because this is a very top, important question. Can you see my, my screen? Can you see what I'm pulling up over here? Yes, we have it. Can you can you see that abutment? No, now it's, uh, now you haven't changed the slide yet. Okay, let me, let me bring it in. Hang on one second and I'll show you this. This is very important. Okay, can you see the slide now? Yes, 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 now we see it. Okay, so this was a, a um, all on four that was done on zirconia. Do you remember when we talked about when we said when you have a different path of draw, for example, over here, when you have a segmented prosthesis, if the implant's a little bit angled, you don't have a path of draw because these are cemented over and then they're given to you as screw retained, but they're cemented over, over the tie bases, right? The problem with them and with that is that when you, when you do one big segmented, do you know what the laboratory technicians do to overcome that path of draw, Omid? A lot of people don't know this. They take a burr and they drill the inside of the prosthesis. And here's a perfect example of it. And let me see if I could zoom. Can you see that? Can you see that cement uh, over? Uh, can you see that over here? Can you see yeah. my screen? Yeah. Look at, look at that cement space that has been ground up. This is what the technicians are doing. And so a lot of doctors don't know this. So what I suggest for doctors to do Every time you get a full arch prosthesis, before you look at the aesthetics, before you look at the ceramics, turn that sucker around and look down inside and see how pristine that connection is, how clean that connection is. Were they able to give you a connection that looks like this with the passive abutment? Look how clean and pristine that looks as opposed to this over here. So this is a question that we must ask and look how terrible that looks. So uh, to answer your question, should we, you know, because we have this path of draw problem, should we do them segmentally? Yes, you can do that, but that also depends on the number of implants. If you have an all on eight or an all on six, yes, you may be able to do that. But if you have an all on four, that protocol changes. The all on four protocol does not uh, call for segmentation. Mm -hmm. So it really depends on what's your modality of implant treatment. I'm an all on four person right now. I used to be a crown and bridge all on six in the past, but because of the nature of the work, because of my uh, work uh, flow right now, we are following the all on four protocol. So it, uh, with the all on four, it's very difficult to segment. But if you have many implants, yes, you could segment them and that kind of solves this problem a little bit. But with the passive abutment, whether you have an all on four, all on eight, all on six, segmental, not segmental with the passive abutment, you're going to have the same two micron fit every time. And, uh, and, and, that, and you, know, you can achieve that predictably where 
you can't do that otherwise without the password. For me, but I mean that's just the way you know it's preference. Thank you so much, Safa. It was it was pretty clear. And again, I want to thank you for your time and for this beautiful comprehensive presentation. We really went in depth in most of the. Uh, concept and key elements in the prosthetic part of implant dentistry. I hope that the audience have enjoyed this comprehensive, better say, instead of presentation like a course, this comprehensive course of uh, prosthetic aspects and implant abutment material selection for long term predictable stability of the. With that said, I Truly, again, want to thank you for accepting this invitation and thank you for joining us on Hot Seat. Hope to see you very soon again and looking forward to great programs and webinars in the future. Thank you so much, Omi John. I just want to say one thing. Um, you know, this concept of the passive abutment is a little bit of a difficult concept to understand. That's why you'll see on our same day group that I will uh, uh, talk about this later. So for people who have not really understand the passive abutment concept for full launches, I am gonna talk about this later and you will see some seminars and webinars coming on that. And I thank Dr. Andrew Aikeman uh, for teaching me this uh, passive abutment because it has really changed the way uh, I do these, um, this has changed the way I'm able to be able to achieve these fit but it's a difficult concept to understand. Uh, uh, you know, g getting retention from a uh, clamping effect of a prosthetic screw, you almost have to take a leap of faith and accept it. Um, you don't have a problem that we used to have with uh, screws into zirconia 20 years ago, because I know this question usually comes up. Uh, so the passive abutment uh, has improved. Things have really been sort of fixed and corrected right now. But we'll talk about it later again. I know it's a difficult concept to, to grasp, it was for me and it is for a lot of people that are introduced to passive abutment. But once you understand it and you stop using it, it becomes very redundant. And lastly, I'd like to thank you for again, um, organizing this and I uh, miss you. And uh, I can't wait for all of this uh, to be over so I can come to Iran to see you. As you know, I'm also Iranian and uh, uh, I enjoy our time that we spend together in Tehran. Delam Baray Iran Khali Tang Shode and I, and I I certainly hope to see you soon. And so thank you for, for doing this. Thanks so much, my friend. Hope to see you very soon. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.